Well, good afternoon. Um, and for those of you who are here, thank you very much for uh, an attendance uh, on the last session on the last day, a lovely Friday afternoon in Auckland. I uh, appreciate you being here. Um, so my name is Mike Goulding. Um, I have done a little bit of stuff around smoking cessation. Uh, part of my uh, master's was around smoking and stress. Uh, but I've spent most of my uh, career around uh, the other addictions, which has been alcohol and other drug and problem gambling. And so today I'm going to talk about several things, but I'm going to draw them together because they all have relationships. And um, the name of my uh, presentation is putting the SC in CEP, and that's smoking cessation alongside coexisting problems. Um, I would also talk about perhaps putting the BL in gaming, and I would suggest that maybe the BL is the nicotine of gaming. So um, having said that, I just really want to talk too about the uh, Ministry of Health's uh, Every Door is the Right Door, which is, um, it's been talked about already today, but we really um, need to be looking at all the addictions and smoking is certainly uh, a major one. There is a goal of being smoke-free in New Zealand by 2025. Currently, I think we have 18% of people still smoking. And some sections of the community are higher than others. So. Let's um, have a look at this, and we'll move on. Um, there was some recent research that just came in, too, from Juniper that said that New Zealand is the fourth highest in the world for adult individual gambling loss, $450 per person. So that's quite a lot, and $1.8 billion for the whole country. So um, just first, I wanted to talk about the Addiction Intervention Competency Framework. In 2010, we aligned the um, competencies for alcohol and other drug, problem gambling, and also smoking cessation. And uh, Sean here, of course, was <coughs> part of uh, lining that up, weren't you? <laughs> um, now, alongside that, of course, um, also preparing the way for CEP was DAPANS, the Drug and Alcohol Practitioners of Aotearoa New Zealand. In 2011, they included problem gambling, as Alison has just said, in the competencies. And uh, Te Whare Tiki in 2013, that's Coexisting Problems, uh, Knowledge and Skills Framework. So there's three um, levels, really, of competence there, foundation, capable, and enhanced. And the expectation is that everybody uh, with the every door is the right door approach will have at least some foundation skills and be able to make sure that someone coming in, even if it's not your particular specialty, you will be able to point them in the right direction and perhaps integrate some of those aspects into your treatment. So the mental health and addiction workforce um, principles that are also um, in that document uh, comes from Te Ari Ari o Te Aranga, which really gave us some guidelines for mental health and addiction and how we work with those. And of course, the principles cover um, all of those dimensions. And so um, obviously, we want to put smoking cessation in there along with the other addictions. So you've seen this diagram probably from Marianne and Sean. It, it originated from Sean. The difference with mine is not only do we have alcohol and other drug disorders, uh, we also have problem gambling and other mental health, but down here on the bottom, I've included smoking, 18%. So 18% would be kind of just inside the other circle. And as you can imagine then, we're actually overlapping quite a lot with all these. Now these are complementary uh, disorders. And the thing is that with alcohol and other drug and problem gambling, we're probably looking at um, you know, a lot of issues around criminality, um, sometimes justice um, stuff gets tangled up with um, the addiction issues and so on. Mental health, of course, can be part of those as well. But smoking is not so much around mood disorders or mental health, uh, apart from the addiction component. It's much more about the cardiovascular uh, system, and it's about death, premature death. So it's more likely to kill you 
more quickly than some of the others, unless you have accident, of course. Okay. So there are huge um, comparisons and, and, I guess, uh, associations between addictions and mental health. Um, a few quotes here from um, research. Uh, Petri came up with the consistent association of problem gambling and alcohol and other drugs and talking about genetic linking, which we're pretty well aware of. We see gambling come down uh, the generations often, and we see alcohol and other drug come down and so on. And, of course, smoking is probably a little bit of hereditary and also a lot of conditioning from being in families where, where people smoke. Um, Two-thirds of those affected by both alcohol and other drug and problem gambling problems had alcohol and drug problems prior to being affected by gambling. And problem gamblers who received prior treatment for alcohol and drug disorders were also more likely to have greater problem gambling se severity and psychological and so psychosocial problems as well than problem gambling without um, prior AOD therapy. So there's a few connections there and some more. 80 to 90 percent of people who had alcohol dependence also smoked. 70% um, of those were heavy smokers, you see. So that's quite high uh, in numbers. And quitting smoking may decrease the likelihood of treated alcohol and other drugs clients relapsing. So because these things are so complementary, um, the associations, the cues, the triggers, they go very well together. Cigarette in one hand, drink in the other, sitting in front of a pokey machine was probably quite prevalent before we had the smoke-free legislation. Tobacco use was elevated in people with severe gambling problems, and you can see 41% in one study, <clears throat> excuse me, and 60% in another. And many mental health clients smoke to relieve symptoms of their illness or reduce medication side effects. So people with schizophrenia are three times more likely to smoke. So there's lots of overlaps there. Now, before I talk about nicotine, um, you'll probably remember the talk that Paparangi gave on the uh, first day in the keynote. She was um, talking a little bit about uh, smoking in the industry and um, also problem gambling treatment in the industry, some of the echoes of uh, similar battles there. And uh, in the old days, of course, smoking was promoted as glamorous, fashionable, helped you relax. There was a lot of image to do with that. And there was one ad that even read, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. So it was even promoted as something that was quite healthy. Um, in 1963, a lawyer for the tobacco industry said, we're in the business of selling nicotine, which is an addictive drug. And uh, another quote in 69 from Philip Morris, we're in the smoke business, it might be more pointed to observe that the cigarette is the vehicle of smoke. Smoke is the vehicle of nicotine, and nicotine is the agent of pleasurable body response. So I guess after a while, the industry got quite concerned that when they talked about free choice, and it was people's right to smoke, if we push the nicotine dependence um, uh, idea too far, that people were probably going to um, open the doors to litigation. So they started to deny vehemently that uh, nicotine and cigarettes were addictive. And of course, we hear lots about the gambling industry and the fact that um, um, gambling provides jobs, it's entertainment, it's a good thing to do, it supports communities through funding, and it's quite a legitimate legal pastime. So there are a lot of um, comparisons there as well. Um, there's another thing here that um, I guess with um, uh, DSM-5 coming out this year, um, or last year I should say, um, we now really recognize, I think, and clinically uh, we're recognizing that these are all addictions um, there's no fudging around the fact that um, these pastimes do create problems for people and there is a, an addiction factor in there, so it's no longer about impulse disorder and so on for problem gambling. So let's get on to nicotine for a moment. Nicotine is a very efficient drug, 
after you inhale um, smoke, nicotine reaches your brain in 10 to 20 seconds. It's got a half-life of two hours. You've got to keep maintaining those levels quite often, otherwise you go into withdrawal and you get some irritability, anxiety, and so on. Um, it activates the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, releasing dopamine, and that's very similar to what happens with alcohol and drugs, um, particularly the um, stimulant drugs, and uh, like cocaine and amphetamine, and problem gambling, because problem gambling activates the same receptors uh, and also uh, affects the dopamine pathway, giving you pleasure and excitement and exhilaration. Um, smoking is also biphasic. So it's a bit like alcohol. It stimulates you initially, and then it can also um, depress you as well. Uh, it can relax you. Um, but cigarettes do improve reaction time and performance uh, concentration, and you get the sensory motor effects as well. There was something to do with um, uh, gambling I read somewhere uh, and smoking where smoking actually activated the tapping reflex and there was something about tapping that kind of fitted well with smoking. People who smoked tended to um, smoke a lot and forget how much they smoked while they were gambling and people of course then spent a lot more on gambling than they realized because they were also smoking and the whole thing kind of contributed and added to the experience. So there's a lot of behavioral reinforcement stuff and a lot of associations there as well. And a perceived stress relief from smoking. And I guess if you're there um, gambling, you've lost a lot of money, you're in that excitement, you're in that zone and you're smoking, you feel calmer, more relaxed, and you, know, you feel like you can cope very well. So even though smoking probably is much more about relieving withdrawal symptoms, it certainly did work in very well with um, gambling. So currently, here we are with smoking. In 2011-12, the New Zealand Health Survey said that we've got 18% of adults smoking. That's 15 and over. 17% of those are smoking daily. Um, that compares with 1996-97 stats. 25% were daily smokers. And in 2006-07, it was 18%. So the trend is going down. However, for Māori, 41% smoke, and there's still little change from back then. So, of course, once again, when we think about risk groups, it's the same for problem gambling, alcohol and drug, and smoking. If you um, are of a certain ethnicity, you're more likely to be um, socioeconomically in a lower section. You might live in a more deprived neighborhood, and therefore your risks for all these things go up. So um, Pacific are 26%. So that's a lot higher than the general finding for the population, but it's also a lot higher than where we want to be if we're thinking about smoke-free in 2025. There's a strong relationship between smoking and deprivation. So if you compare the areas of deprivation with 28% people smoking uh, in the least uh, deprivation areas, only 11%. So it's a lot less even than the average. So. Um, Pacific and Maori, of course, are therefore sharing greater risk of all these addictions. And of course, the age group of high risk, 18 to 34, um, that is for um, you know, not only smoking, but also problem gambling. So um, looking at smoke-free legislation, I guess one of the things about the bricks and mortar aspect of this was that if you're inside, you're not uh, allowed to smoke. And that um, came about in 2004. The thing is that what they found immediately when people were no longer allowed to smoke in a casino or in uh, pubs and clubs, suddenly the patronage dropped off or some, somehow the gambling uh, takings dropped significantly. And of course, in a US example here in Illinois, there's a 22% loss in, in revenue. And uh, in Victoria, Australia, 14% revenue reduction. And of course, there's a little bit of the same thing here straight after the smoking legislation. And there's a lot of reasons for that, I guess, um, you know, with complementary activities like that, uh, you know, your cues and triggers uh, are going to be affected if you can't smoke as well. The other thing, I guess, is that if you go outside to have a cigarette, because it's quite a strong addiction, when you want to smoke, you want to smoke. You're not going to sit at a gambling table or a machine for hours and hours. 
and uh, not have a cigarette. So out you go, have a cigarette, and you look around, and it's sunny, and you're thinking, God, how long have I been here, and how much have I spent? And you might leave, you might go home. So that's going to affect takings as well. So it would be fair to say that the gambling interest industry was not that keen on the fact that they've lost the ability to have their patrons smoke and have that enhanced gambling experience, uh, which has affected revenues. And of course, we don't really, if we're thinking about health and smoking, and if we're thinking about the smoking goal, we don't really want people to have complementary activities which are going to enhance all these addictions and cause more problems, particularly smoking-related deaths. So the smoking industry, of course, now has found that it's quite good because they don't have credibility so much on their own because of the history. Um, they work through third-party allies, so they often get hospitality and um, the gaming industry to help them oppose smoke-free laws. And so it benefits both. So it's a combined approach often when they lobby. And uh, they often finance economic uh, impact research, which um, you know, tends to support um, the arguments for maintaining smoking and casinos. So <coughs> um, seeing that uh, in Australia there were some casino smoking exemptions, um, Sky City lobbied the New Zealand government here to allow smoking in particular areas where they were well ventilated because obviously they wanted to have that benefit to increase the gambling takings, I guess, and for also uh, people, especially international guests, to have this more uh, enjoyable gaming experience. Um, so the Diamond Lounge uh, was enclosed and roof, but it had huge ventilator fans. It was ventilated and it passed the um, Ministry of Health airflow calculator um, kind of uh, guidelines so that it, it could allow for people to be able to um, gamble and smoke safely. Uh, however, there was a challenge to that legality by the Salvation Army Problem Gambling Foundation and the Cancer Society, and that was successful, so um, they're not able to just carry on and do that. Um, basically, the argument was if you can hang a picture on the walls, it's indoors. So um, they lost that. So online gambling. Now let's look at um, technology stuff here. Global gambling generated 419 billion. That's total gambling of every kind in 2011. We're looking towards 500 billion in 2014. That's this year. In 2012, online gambling was only 8% of global gambling revenue. So 29 billion, but it's expected to rise 30% yearly, and we're looking ahead to 38 billion in 2015. That's a lot of money. And when you think about total New Zealand gambling, loss is 1.8 million, and here we're looking at 38 billion. You know, it's huge. Currently, um, there's 2,859 online casinos. That's a lot of uh, casinos you can access on the internet. So that's 24/7 online at the moment, uh, mainly at sports betting, but uh, casinos, poker and bingo, they're coming you know, not far behind. And um, the way that they're working with uh, technology and, and better graphics and so on with games and most importantly, platforms to change from social gaming to real money games and the security around money transactions is, is gonna really boost up those games. Now, Facebook introduced real money in 2012, the Zynga Plus Poker and Zynga Plus Casino, and already it's 1.7 billion, so there's quite a lot of money there. And we have a lot of Facebook people here in New Zealand and worldwide. So mobile phones, of course, are the big thing, and we heard um, the other day uh, about the growth of um, uh, mobile phones, huge numbers worldwide and they're very personalized. And of course, this is the kind of stuff that you can see, bright, colorful image and good graphics, and all these games are available on the go. So basically, um, the challenge is to migrate play money gamblers to real money games, and um, organizations like Cash, Cash Bet and Adobo uh, have developed platforms for them to bridge that gap between that kind of um, you know, social play to um, real money gambling. 
And so the quote here, access to real money online, gambling is a game changer for social and mobile game developers who want to grow revenues from this channel. So there's a number of organizations all working together. It's the, the technological people um, providing the hardware and then there's the software and uh, then there's the people who embrace uh, mobile phone technology and um, you know, put it all together and, and enjoy that instant gratification of being able to bet on the go. Um, as you can see here, um, with these platforms, you can actually um, create an account very easily, and you can do that while you're standing there with your phone, so it's quite instant if you decide you want to do this. Um, cash bet, then uh, you look at um, the ease you can put money in, and you'll note that the quick deposits here, so you put your money in so you can gamble from your account, and if you put 150 pounds in, you get 15 free pounds as a bonus. If you put 100 pounds in, you get a bonus of five pounds. So, uh, and then there's nothing for 50 and 10. So the incentive is to get you to put more money in, which you're gonna gamble, and you get a bit of extra money, but it's interesting that they would do that because they know they're gonna get it back. So it's really boosting gambling quite a bit there as well. And this is so accessible. Now, I like this one a lot. Uh, I normally wear glasses. These are not Google glasses. But as you can see, Google Glass is a device worn like a pair of spectacles that allows people to take photos, receive video calls, get translations, and it's wearable technology. Now Westpac, one of our bigger banks here in New Zealand, it has a trial with an application for Google Glass, and you can check your bank balance on a device, and you don't have to log on. The bank will also extend the services for Google Glass so users can transfer money between accounts. So what does that mean for gambling? You might have your mobile, you might also wear a pair of glasses. Now, I don't know whether these are prescription glasses, but I don't see why they couldn't be in the future. And uh, can you imagine people all wearing glasses and having this kind of technology, the ability to know where your money's up to and, and to use that for betting uh, enhances and is, you know, it complicates the whole thing around technology. There's just so many options. So mobile technology here, estimated unique users of mobile gambling services, 63 million <coughs> worldwide. And by 2018, we're looking at 164 million. Uh, the drivers then for all this mobile technology and gambling, you've got 24 seven use anywhere, anytime, remotely. Um, the casino style games are uh, increasing in popularity. And of course, as we know, we've got apps for everything. They're quite cheap and they're getting better and better. Uh, so there's huge comp uh, competition, uh, not only for um, the cell phone that you buy, the smartphone, but also um, the apps, who's got the best apps. Technology now bringing together social media gambling, mobile money transactions with security and latest technology for uh, content and the graphics. So bringing it all together then, what does it mean? Well, okay, bricks and mortar, we've kind of helped slow down the smoking gambling combination here. However, once you get into mobile technology and once you talk about treatment for problem gamblers and you look at the enhancement of um, gambling, uh, I guess when people smoke and have other addictions, I mean, uh, when you're on the go and when you're in the pub, uh, when you're in a casino, when you're anywhere, really, if you've got a mobile phone, you've got that instant access and you can um, sidestep all the smoking legislation. You go out and you can smoke and you can drink and you can do all this stuff. And so the complementary goods angle, really, these things are gonna enhance each other and um, you can do it anywhere, at home, anytime, anywhere. And um, you've got syncing devices, you've got your smartphone, your iPad, smart TV, et cetera, et cetera. So sitting at home, of course, is another magnificent way of, of having all the gambling of the world really at your fingertips and all the addictions you can eat. <laughs> you can have all your fast food, you can have your smoking, your, your gambling and your alcohol and drugs. <laughs> Do the lot. <laughs> Sexual addiction? No, I won't go there. <laughs> so, but the whole thing is there, isn't it, really? <laughs> so how are we going in treating problem gambling and smoking so far? Okay, our track record isn't that great in looking at smoking and treatment. I remember uh, when I first started alcohol and drug, 
people um, basically, you know, they specialize in alcohol and drugs. That was it. Um, smoking, oh gosh, you know, hang on, one at a time. I, I, I've got to have those to get through so I can manage my alcohol and drug, you know, getting to, to recovery. Same with problem gambling and so on. And often it was left till the end. And I guess um, people uh, also didn't really know what to do about smoking that much. I mean, obviously there were interrelated activities, complementary activities. And so the chances then of people smoking continuing, continuing after they've kind of given up other things, uh, being a trigger, being a cue to go and gamble because it's an association, it, it was still a relapse factor. And um, I guess when you're looking at residential settings, um, sometimes, and I have heard this story lately, that people have come in, they, they haven't addressed the smoking prior to residential treatment. And so when the smoking, you know, the, the urge got so bad, they left treatment, which left, you know, other treatments up in the air, basically. And so it's really important to be able to address that smoking issue so it doesn't impact on your uh, ability to um, deal with other addictions as well. So um, the expectations here of integrated treatment basically are that when we look at CEP, at least the competence, basic competence level of foundation, which would be, say for instance in smoking, looking at the ABC method, which is ask, provide some brief advice, and cessation support. You can actually do a, a very quick training online. Um, you know, it takes you less than half an hour really, and you. Um, past that, you get sent quit cards, you can prescribe these then, and you can um, get, I think for about $3, I think it is, people can go to a pharmacy, get nicotine replacement therapy, gum patches, the whole shebang. And you can do a bit of counseling and integrate that with your problem gambling treatment. And I know a lot of practitioners can prescribe quit cards, I think it's great. Um, and so I think it's really quite important that we not only look at today, and we look at the people, say, with gambling problems, but what about the um, family members, too? Because family members who uh, also smoke, when the problem gambler goes back and, you know, you're dealing with some of these treatment issues, if everyone's still smoking, there's those relapse potential uh, ideas there. And also, I think, um, if you, in treatment, address um, that smoking issue, that the patches or the gum or whatever and the information that goes home can also spread to family members in the wider community. So if we're going to kind of tackle that 2025 goal of smoke free, there can be some real gains made in treatment if we address all these issues. So I think with a lot of services, we're still a long way off. But I think uh, what we're really wanting, I guess, with CEP is kind of that holistic treatment. And it's just about, OK, they're here for problem gambling, but we might think about mental health and, and, and alcohol and drug. But are we also thinking about smoking? I'm not sure that everyone does. And so I just really want to encourage that today because I think it's really important because of the fact that these are complementary behaviors. And are the training needs required for that? So it may be that um, that's part of the training coming up is not just the alcohol and drug and mental health alongside problem gambling, it's also smoking cessation. So in summary, complementary activities, we know that smoking contributes to the perseverance of gambling behaviors. With the latest technology, we've got to think about not just now, but the future, and the idea that um, you know, it's not going to be a protective factor in a casino or a pub or a club that they can't smoke and enhance their gambling. Mobile technology will get around that, and uh, it might be that you know, it, it gets more complicated to deal with not only that as a gambling issue, but also the uh, complementary activities that go along with it. So when we're looking at integrating our treatment, we need to think about how we can you know, work across all those things. Um, there's very uh, easy access to gambling and very instant access to money. And also the pace of technological change is increasing. We don't know what the potential is for that. So unlimited opportunities to smoke with technology and um, I guess it, it creates future challenges. And so my challenge today, I guess, is let's put that smoking cessation in there with our other coexisting stuff when we deal with our clients and family members. Thank you.
Yes. <laughs> when you talk about gaming, it sounds lovely and friendly, and it also mobile game technology and everything else. And we also think about young people and, and games. Uh, whereas we talk about gambling and problem gambling, the BL is basically the um, bit that changes it from a nice friendly gaming to what it really is. It's gambling, right? So I'm just saying, you know, they used to deny the nicotine. The, they used to deny the nicotine factor. They used to deny the nicotine factor in, in Siggy's, and now they're denying the BL, which I think is the nicotine factor in gambling. It's gaming, not, you know, gambling. It's just an industry thing of a softening. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> I think we should all go to the beach. <laughs> Thank you very much.